also um, being recorded. Uh, welcome everyone to our last Michi and Walter Weglin Endowed Chair Social Justice Webinar Series. So wonderful to see familiar faces and some new faces here. We have, according to Eventbrite, about over 80 people who have RSVP'd. I'm sure folks will be slowly trickling in, but for many folks who have challenges with Zoom or whatever that's happening for people, uh, it is also on Facebook Live. We also notice from past events, we have over 200 people who watch on Facebook Live as well. So I know that today's event will be quite, uh, I, I think will be viewed quite, uh, quite a bit, largely um, because we have this incredible topic, uh, which I will get to in a second. But first I wanted to start off with introducing myself for those of you who may not know me. My name is Dr. Mary Kami Udenico. I'm the director of the Wegelin Endowed Chair for Multicultural Studies. It is my honor to be able to direct this um, endowed chairship because we have some phenomenal folks that I, I get to work with and um, our advisory committee along with our Wedland intern Daniela Castillo who is here and Kelly Wen who would be here except she's hold on one second I hear my echo sorry about that I'm hearing my own I'm hearing my own echo from my video Hold on one second. Sorry about that, folks. As I'm going Facebook Live, I'm hearing myself and it's not fun. I need to delete this. All right, there you go. I deleted myself. All right. So um, Kelly Wen is president of Psychi, so she has her going senior going senior, last senior outing thing. So she can't be here today. Um, but I do want to start off with land acknowledgement at Cal Poly Pomona. We um, sit in the territory of the Tongva people. And so I think for those of you who are online, and if you would be kind enough to share with your via chat, um, you know, where do you come from? What ocean, what land do you currently reside in? Um, that would be wonderful for you to share as well. So apologies for the little technical glitch with my Facebook Live going on. Uh, Michi and Walter Weglin Endowed Chair um, has been doing something about over 12 events this academic year. And, you know, all of which uh, have been focused on issues about social justice, largely defined, and really unpacking issues and contemporary as well as historical issues that may resonate for folks. But I think more than anything, it, it has been a wonderful space to build community to learn, to grow, and to share information. Um, and today is really no exception with uh, Dr. Jesse Vallejo, who is one of our awesome um, ethnomusicology professors at Cal Poly Pomona, who received her doctorate from UCLA. Uh, she's cur currently working on a manuscript about indigenous cultural linguistic revitalization projects and mariachi. And she uh, is the director of the mariachi ensemble here on campus. Um, she is an, a, a quite prolific scholar, has written extensively on ethnomusicology and also um, perform as you know, folks, professors and academics in, in music, not only write, but they also perform. And she has performed at the Kennedy Center, um, at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, uh, Redondo Beach Performing Arts Center. She's done stuff at the Hun Huntington Gardens. Um, and um, she's been at a two-week intensive program in Beijing, China, and she's also performed at the Carnegie. And we're just very, very fortunate to have someone of her caliber at Cal Poly Pomona uh, working with us. But she has also been an instrumental mentor and advocate for underserved students, in particularly, you know, first-generation students and, and um, Black, Indigenous, and students of color. And so we're very, very fortunate to have someone like her here. And today, um, you know, when she is also on the Wegelin Advisory Committee, and we talked about what can we do to not, not only just unlearn the narratives of Cinco de Mayo that has been passed on to us as a drunken frenzy of, you know, people partying all the time, but really understanding the history and the roots of, um, of this particular day um, that really doesn't exist in Mexico, but only here in, in the United States. So I am so excited to introduce Dr. Vejo to all of our folks here on Zoom, as well as our Facebook world. And so please give her a warm, warm welcome. 
Thank you. Now I'm all nervous. <laughs> I see some um, friends on here on Zoom and um, from campus and from off campus. So I'm really excited everybody had time to make it. And um, I will be completely honest, this is a totally new area for me to dive into. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the beginning of the presentation. So I'm just going to share my screen and make sure that I share the video, share sound. Okay. And so I think I will try and watch um, Mary in case anything happens, um, sound and all of that, let me know. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is kind of encompassing a lot of things and it's my process of going through some of the reading of the background behind some of the music I teach in some of my classes. So um, primarily I made an arrangement I was working on it back in fall of 2019 for the mariachi students. We were supposed to premiere it at the uh, Napa Mariachi Festival um, more than a year ago. And, um, you know, because of COVID and everything that uh, got interrupted. And then, um, so after everything that happened with uh, Black Lives Matter this last year, I just felt like I needed to make sure this happened, even though it's been a, a an interesting project to do um, teaching remotely and everything with performance. So it's bear with me. We're covering a lot of ground. Um, I'm not necessarily a historian, but it, this is my my learning process. So you get to join along with me. Um, so uh, first of all, I have a PhD in ethnomusicology. And as um, Dr. Danico mentioned, uh, my studies and my research is really grounded in um, uh, Native American studies. And most of my work has been with Quechua flutists. I've also worked with Kanikeha, uh, Mohawk teachers and uh, musicians, but I spend a lot of my time performing. And so my applied scholarship with mariachi performances, I'm usually gigging about a, around like 80 times a year. So I'm doing this, I'm, I'm like a weekend warrior and sometimes in between, but um, so here's just some pictures of me in my uh, Cal Poly Bronco outfit and then um, playing at the Smithsonian Festival with some of the flutists who came up. Um, so I um, began this presentation or I began this work because um, of friendship and I feel like um, sometimes it's nice to reflect on how our lives are guided through friendships and you know our professional lives. And so J. Michael O'Neill uh, used to teach the Soul Ensemble at uh, Cal Poly Pomona. And we both taught Tuesday, Thursday nights. So we would always find each other at the end of a long day, um, at the end of rehearsals where we were like jived up, but, um, and like ready to chat, but it was like a long day. So it's just a lot of times that we saw each other in the halls and we're like, why don't we collaborate? You know, a lot of our students, um, overlapped between the ensembles because we had like an hour difference. Um, so this really came out of me telling him, you know, I've heard this uh, mariachi group um, over at Casa Sanchez in, in West LA um, perform, why is it blanking on me now? Sir Duke, they perform Sir Duke and it was amazing. And so he and I got to talking about soul mariachi collaborations. And so I really want to give him a shout out for inspiring me to do this and explore. Will some you be mine <laughs> um, Bethlehem, I can hear you. Make sure you're muted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so another reason why I wanted to explore this is because um, my, my father's side of the family is well, my father was born in Los Angeles in Cudahy. And um, so growing up, we were one of two Mexican American families in multiple counties across um, upstate New York. Um, I didn't have a Mexican or Chicano community. I didn't have um, ethnic studies classes to take um, that focused on Latin American studies. I, did, I was very lucky to have an ethnic studies class um, in high school with Mr. Henry and it really changed um, my life, I think a lot at that age. Um, but I didn't really get to study anything about Latin America until I was in graduate school. Um, so I just had pictures here. This is my, these are my grandparents, my grandpa Jose Luis and my grandmother Grace. Um, and, you know, I got into mariachi and I got into a lot of these musical explorations wanting to know about my family in Mexico. 
but they met in Los Angeles. They worked at a cafeteria in Glendale, I believe. And here you see my grandfather in his uh, chef suit with a friend and with old cars. Um, uh, he never talked about like wearing zoot suits or this time period of his life um, before he passed away, but um, it's something I've been interested in. Uh, you see my grandparents at Christmas in, L in Los Angeles, and then my grandfather has had this 1948 Ford Coupe. And now um, over the last like 10 years, my dad has sort of taken over, or most of my life actually, my dad has been restoring this Ford Coupe. Um, so I tell my dad it's like his dissertation, he has to finish it. And so um, I'm waiting until we get to uh, ride out in it. But um, so this is my grandfather working on it. Um, I think just after they moved to New York and they drove that from Los Angeles to New York. So um, yeah, so I wanted to learn a little bit more about uh, my family roots. And um, I also <laughs> uh, was really upset a couple years ago. Um, I was sitting at a meeting with several Cal Poly faculty and somebody made the joke about Cinco de Drinco. And I think what hurt the most is that everybody laughed and nobody stood up for people. And I've been called spicy when I've disagreed with people. And the, just the anger in that moment um, was, I wanted to channel it into doing something positive for the students and giving us more information where we wouldn't be caught off guard when those things happen. And we can respond with clearer facts that um, maybe some people won't feel the need to say, oh, that's spicy. You know, you can say, well, here are the facts. Uh, so I just wanna say that Cal Poly faculty, we can do much better, especially if we're working at a Hispanic serving institute and a minority serving institute. I never wanna hear these comments again, ever. Um, or else I'll show up at your door at 3 a.m. playing trumpet. And I'm a terrible trumpet player, but I will gladly do it. Um, so, <laughs> I also wanted to um, explore some overlaps between applied scholarships, so performance. You know, a lot of times with the mariachi ensemble, I've normally had only two hours a week with the students, and that's not enough time to learn about 20 songs per semester, prepare for about 10 performances per semester and everything. So the students are always telling me, we wanna know more about the history, but it's really hard to squeeze that in. Um, on the flip side, with my uh, elective of Musics of Mexico, when I have that class, the students are learning more of the history of things and, and reading a lot, but I make sure they perform with my mariachi students on the concert. So this arrangement was also supposed to be a collaboration between both classes and ensembles. Um, I also am thinking ahead to the ethnic studies requirement and how we can um, beef up our ethnic studies elements in our classes in uh, at Cal Poly and, and in the CSU. Um, and then, let me see, Chad. Um, oh, thank you, Denise. <laughs> and then um, I wanted to learn more about Pomona. I know that Pomona has had a really rich uh, musical culture and cultures, and um, some of my senior project students have looked at punk music in, in the area. And so I just wanted to have more knowledge about this new home for me. Um, well, relatively new. I've been in California for 11, 12 years and um, Pomona, um, I just moved here during the pandemic. So just to reemphasize, um, I this is not my specialty area. I didn't grow up knowing any of this. Um, it's been a process. I think a lot of people of color get pinned as being a professional ex ethnicity, nationality, whatever. Um, because I play mariachi music, people assume I'm a professional Mexican and I know all the different styles of Mexican music. I know everything about the Spanish speaking world. I don't. So, um, so this is a kind of tip of the iceberg and I'd be happy later to share a reading list, but I know it's by far not um, a an exhaustive list and I have so much to learn still. So first I want to go over the stereotypes of Cinco de Mayo. And some of these I knew growing up, some of these I've learned recently. Um, so first of all, we have um, the fact that people assume that uh, the Mexican Independence Day is Cinco de Mayo, but really that's September 16th. And um, the fight for independence lasted 11 years. 
Um, but September 16th marks the beginning of that um, in 1810. Um, then we also have the issues of it being Cinco de Drinco. And, you know, I reflect back on the few representations I was exposed to growing up of um, Latinos and, and Mexicans and Chicanos. I didn't even know really what being a Chicano meant until I moved to California. That's how I think isolated uh, where I grew up was in terms of a sense of Chicano community and, and nobody talked about it at school. Um, but uh, Speedy Gonzalez was one of the only representations, Speedy Gonzalez and basically Ricky Ricardo. And I just remember watching those with my father and that was all we had. So um, sometimes we laughed, but sometimes you realize it's really harmful stereotypes. Um, you know, Speedy always being the hard, busy bee worker, fast at everything. So everybody expects to dump their work on you and, and you'll get it done because you're, you're, you've got grit. Um, but then you also have his cousin Slowpoke um, and the other friends who are always drunk or stoned at the cantinas. And you can't make this up, but as I was looking for images, I found a brewer who decided to make a, a, a lager beer and called it um, Sexy Fun Time Brewing and Slowpoke Cerveza and is using polenta. And yes, there's a corn connection with the Americas, but polenta is an Italian dish. Um, so there are a whole bunch of ways that you realize people just don't know anything about all of these issues. So I just wanted to um, highlight that. We need, we need ethnic studies so badly. Um, then there's also a lot of us will say, well, it's not a, an important date. It's no big deal in Mexico. It was just one battle out of many for this long period of, um, of pushing out the French, right? And so uh, that's not necessarily true. This was a, a pivotal moment with, um, the, with Mexicans pushing out the French after the second um, intervention. And I go into that a little bit more, but it, it is an important date but it is more important in the US um, or I'll say north of the Rio Grande because the borders have changed, right? Um, so there's the idea that it's not an American holiday, um, but this is, this is uh, partly true, partly not true in the sense that um, with different stages of celebrating Cinco de Mayo or observing it, um, the meanings have changed and we'll go over some of that, um, but I would say it is an American holiday, just like I'd say mariachi music is an American style of music. And um, I want us to, to challenge this idea that um, just be, it's the way that Mexicans and also I, I feel like um, Latinos and people who are from different parts of the world like Asia, we get our Asian continent, um, we get told we're not American, we can't be American, we don't look American. And I want to push back and just because we get told we're not American, that's not true. And people don't have the right to sit there and say in a very important holiday for um, the United States today, it is American. So, um, and it's an important uh, holiday to observe and recognize the interracial solidarity and pushes for civil rights for hundreds of years at this point um, in, in what's now known as the United States. So, and then there's also the stereotype that it's over commercialized as if that somehow justifies not caring about it, but why would that make it meaningless? I mean, we can look at the commercialized celebrations of it as not carrying the meaning that it, it has had, but um, you know, would you say that Christmas is not important for Christians just because it's commercialized? I think that that's a weak argument. So um, yeah, so. I'm hoping I'm helping dispel the myth and we'll go through some of the facts that'll give you um, info about to help you with that. Um, I want to just highlight in a time where we have a lot of uh, uh, racial tensions and a lot of ways that the news spins, you know, it's, you know, a, a Latino killed somebody who's black or a black person beat up somebody who's Asian. And there's a, a lot of this presented in the, um, in the news. That's not always true. And if, and I want us to recognize where lots of people have done great um, interracial solidarity work and push for civil rights. And then I hope you enjoy some of the music we listen to and are making and can appreciate all the work that went into this arrangement that I made for the students um, at Cal Poly. 
Okay, a little bit more about the dates in Cinco de Mayo um, between Mexico and the U.S. and um, when, you know, California before it was part of the U.S. and all of that. But basically in um, the 1830s, you had the pastry war. Um, there were already French immigrants um, in Mexico who had set up businesses like a pastry shop. Um, there had been damages and claims of what was owed and the French intervened um, and tried to sort of get their foot in the door to take over Mexico um, and demanding ridiculous sums of money that Mexico was like, screw this, I'm not gonna pay for it. Um, and so there were disagreements with that. Then um, in 1855, I just wanted to highlight around this time in the US, um, and in California specifically, you had the Greaser Act or Anti-Vagrancy Act. And Greaser is a, an ethnic slur. Um, and this was a time when people who spoke Spanish and were particularly um, Latino, Mexican, or indigenous, they were targeted by how they looked and lynchings were allowed and violent deportation and removal was allowed and encouraged. And it overlapped with some of the anti-Asian legislature that was being passed around the same time, trying to block people from coming in from uh, particularly China and Japan and um, parts of East Asia. Uh, then we also have the American Civil War. And this is really the, the main point that um, in history that why Cinco de Mayo is important because um, the Civil War uh, happened just after California became the 31st state and I'm, I'm not a great historian I, I need like the dates right in front of me but um, so if I make any mistakes um, we can you can correct me in the chat I guess um, but uh, the American Civil War happened just after California became a state and um, so a lot of Californians identified as Californiano in between um, being Mexican and, and part of the US and all of this stuff. So uh, what happened was people in California did not want to have this, the um, Confederacy win because of the ways that um, enslavement and um, the elitism and the racism um, was, was seen as being a very negative thing for everybody in the Californian region. So people in California fought for both sides, for the union and for Mexico, and they supported both sides even with money. And um, having the Confederacy fall at, was made possible by having the French pushed out from, um, from Mexico. And so in 1862, the Battle of Puebla was part of that where the French were pushed out, therefore the Confederacy was weakened and um, and people were winning on two side, a two-sided war, essentially. Uh, and then what we have is in the um, 1860s, we have um, the 13th Amendment passed. Um, you know, you can watch the Netflix uh, documentary on it and read all of, about it. Um, but just because um, enslavement was abolished. It didn't mean that it was always enforced. And then we had all of the other harmful policies put in place after. So like Jim Crow laws. And so um, Mexicans and Latinos, Central Americans, and often indigenous people, depending on how people um, saw how they looked and interpreted their identities, um, people were sort of getting both sides of oppression of like the deportation and you can't, you're not from here, you can't be American. And then the segregation in public spaces and lynchings and things like that. So um, there's shared oppression across a lot of lines here. Um, then uh, even in places like uh, Claremont, so just up the road from Cal Poly, um, there were theaters where uh, there were you know, Mexican only rows and black only rows and people had to sit like in the front row so they couldn't see comfortably. And that was if they were even allowed into an establishment, right? So there are a lot of ways that um, people's movements and people's bodies and voices were policed. So um, by 1877, you have early celebrations of Cinco de Mayo in California. And um, there were other One's um, documented in, I believe it's the Hayes Bautista book where um, you have, I'm just looking for the other years, in 1886 and 1893, there were um, 
advertisements and these celebrations included parades and music and um, theatrical performances like operettas, so um, known as zarzuela in Spanish. So um, this has been a long standing tradition of celebrating Cinco de Mayo in Southern California. Um, and then a fun fact uh, to reemphasize my point, and this point is made in my friend uh, Lauren Salazar's dissertation. Um, Dr. Salazar argues that mariachi music is American, and um, the earliest recordings of mariachi were not in Mexico, they were in Chicago and um, Northern California. And there's documentation of people playing music as much as people were traveling to work fields, um, as much as people were. Um, you know, part of the Bracero program. And some of my family had been part of these, you know, north south movements to Colorado and um, through El Paso and places. So um, this mariachi music has long been performed and documented in, um, in the United States or north of the Rio Grande. And also um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the innovations of mariachi music that have happened that are very much American and happen with people living in the United States um, and has changed it for even how it's practiced in Mexico. So in between 1910 and 1920, you had the um, Mexican Revolutionary Wars. And so this led to a different type of you know, waves of immigration. So um, before you have uh, people who lived in the California region before it was part of the United States, um, you had people who were part of um, the, the two-sided war and the fight to topple the French and the Confederacy. Um, and then after the Mexican Revolutionary Wars, you had a fresh wave of immigrants coming who didn't really understand that background of the history. And um, this is when the celebrations for Cinco de Mayo began, began to be more Mexican focused. And um, that's where the Battle of Puebla, oh, it's celebrating the Battle of Puebla. That's it. Like, you know, what else is there to it type thing. Um, so some of the festivities changed and the their mutual aid society with different parts of Mexico and like different communities where if people moved from one community up to um, California, you know, they'd have connections still with their communities. You still see this with um, like soccer teams even or different types of bands and um, music ensembles in places like California. You have entire soccer teams in San Jose made up of people whose families are all from the same town in, in Michoacan, for example. Um, so this was also a time um, when uh, the demographics of other places that get talked up about a lot more like Boyle Heights um, was changing. So um, during the world wars, uh, you had um, places like Boyle Heights and in different parts of California, you had very diverse communities. Um, but uh, with many people being Japanese or Filipino or Sikh or um, Mexican or Central American or Native American or Eastern European and Jewish, they, these um, diverse communities were seen as a threat. And the government actually had policies. Um, Los Angeles City had blue laws where they would break up um, youth gatherings if they were interracial. Um, Boyle Heights was seen as a national security threat. And um, when a lot of the wars were happening, when people were displaced for, and put into internment camps, um, there were a lot of people who had been living in, in Boyle Heights, for example. And there were a lot of people like down the road from Cal Poly Pomona at the Fairplex um, who that, that used to be an internment camp. And now we have um, children who've been stuck at the border for for years now um, coming to the Fairplex and other places soon. And it has this really painful history. And so those of you who aren't in the Pomona area right now, these are things that our city government is discussing and people are debating and everything. But I feel like Cal Poly doesn't always acknowledge this um, very like important but painful local history. So um, during this time was also when um, the, the rhetoric or the narrative um, was geared towards getting people to fight for the wars. Um, and the idea of Cinco de Mayo was more related to this US-Mexico um, cooperation. And like, um, and so it was, it, it still shifted where it was losing its sense of ties to the civil war and was changing shape um, for, um, trying to show a, like a sisterhood or brotherhood between Mexico and the US, but against Europe. So 
there's that. Um, so just a summary, early Cinco de Mayo celebrations were uh, recognizing the um, abolitionist movements that were part of it and the, um, the two-sided war uh, between the 20s and 40s, things became more focused on the Battle of Puebla reasons or like what was going on in Mexico and sort of forgetting the um, Californian history of it um, and, you know, Texas and every and the Southwest. And then after the 1940s, you had um, uh, a lot of people who stayed or were coming from uh, being a part of the Bracero program um, and working the fields while people had been um, at out uh, to war. Uh, people were able to stay. There were amnesty uh, programs. My grandfather was one of the people who got his um, citizenship in the 80s. Uh, when just tons of people were able to um, gain their citizenship uh, more easily. Um, and then you also had the Chicano movement happening, um, getting into, you know, like the 60s and 70s uh, with civil rights movements. And so Cinco de Mayo became this focus of how to celebrate a Chicano identity, but it had gone through this sort of process where um, it still wasn't always tied back to the, the abolitionist movements and the, the American Civil War um, reasons why um, Cinco de Mayo happened. So um, talking about some of the oppression that was happening, we have um, some examples that I wanted to show. Uh, for example, uh, Mendez versus Westminster. This was a, a segregation at, in schools case that happened, um, was it Sylvia Mendez? I'm blanking on her first name, but um, she was born in Santa Ana and schools were highly uh, segregated. And so her case um, laid the groundwork for Brown versus Board of Education and a lot of the um, work later that happened that's been really important for um, the US and especially black communities. Um, Naticano is one of my, he's like my mariachi grandfather. Um, I studied with his protege, uh, Jesus Guzman, and at UCLA for a number of years. And my students get to work with Jesus Guzman and members of the Camperos. Um, and so Naticano was performing with Los Camperos in Lubbock, Texas, and came across a sign that said basically no Mexicans allowed and at, at restaurants. And so being really upset about it and how a lot of times people would play just table uh, by table for tips. He came back to LA and said, I, I don't ever want to deal with this again. And he started the whole mariachi um, venue staged dinner show, right? And so La Fonda, um, sadly, because of COVID, it closed again. The Camperos had reopened it. Um, I'm not sure what the plans are for the building yet, but um, so this is over near MacArthur Park and it changed how mariachi music is sort of marketed and experienced all over the world in terms of having a dinner show where you're not paying the musicians by tips, you're going to see the show, right? And so this was a response to that type of discrimination. Um, then uh, with some of the agricultural work, I just wanted to recognize that um, people like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta were working with, and actually the the strike was influenced by um, people like Larry Itliang over here, uh, Filipino farm worker, and also Philip Veracruz. And so um, I haven't had time to find some of the names of, for example, like Sikh and Japanese workers who are a part of this, but I remember going through the Japanese American National Museum in downtown Los Angeles, and they have a section about the songs and like protests in, uh, in the farms around the farmlands in the Central Valley. So um, if you're in the area, I recommend you visit that museum and you can learn more about um, that contribution. But um, so again, you know, Mexicans and um, Latinos were dealing with a lot of the same discrimination and oppression that um, black communities have been and um, Asian communities have been. So there were a lot of lines of overlapping work for civil rights. Um, now in Corona, California, uh, I know, so Alamillo, um, uh, I have his book right here. Um, so this book, he has a couple articles, uh, but making lemonade out of lemons and looking at um, the agricultural workers in uh, Corona and sort of the Pomona and um, uh, Valley areas. And these are some of the older uh, Cinco de Mayo presentation, or sorry, celebrations. And usually they're kind of community focused. And um, 
Some people theorize, although I'm not sure if there's any hardcore proof for it, that um, Corona beer figured, well, well, it's close enough, like we can sort of overlap or capitalize on the fact that Corona, California is one of the places that has had citrus growers. It has had um, an, an important part of an important tradition of celebrating Cinco de Mayo because of the region's connections to um, different waves of immigration from Mexico and support for um, uh, the Union and Mexico during the Civil War period. And let's see, so, sorry, I had to move the, our images. So in 1940s, um, you had morning radio stations were a really important part of the soundscape for families, um, especially Mexican and Central American, who are working in um, the citrus fields that are all around. And you see um, citrus is still really influential in the area. Cal Poly has its citrus groves. You see Riverside has it. Um, I have a lemon tree in my house, which is uh, was really exciting. Um, so a lot of people who recorded the music we're going to hear uh, covers of, they grew up with their parents who worked in these fields or worked other jobs that they had to be up early. So like we're talking 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. radio time slots. And they were listening to not only rancheros from Mexico, but Tejano music, uh, Puerto Rican and Cuban music. Um, and so sometimes in, we can critique the term like Latino or Latinx, there's a lot of issues with it, but at the same time, there's ways that people were sort of having a, a like an umbrella identity too, um, through things like these radio stations and shows. Um, Alamillo writes about how there were uh, workers in the groves who would sing and they would take turns singing so that the work wasn't so boring or, or arduous and it, you could sing and kind of distract yourself from the difficulty of the labor. Um, but oftentimes people were silenced. Um, there was a picker from uh, Laverne, which is just north of Pomona. And um, they, they talked about in Alamillo's book of how um, their voices were silenced and people said, stop singing, you know, get back to work. Um, so I feel like the, the significance of being able to have a voice, make music, perform live and, and be a part of American uh, rock and roll history is rooted in this region, in this moment, um, and in, you know, overcoming these uh, types of discrimination. So, like I said earlier, there is a mix of um, uh, Spanish language music from across the Americas that was the basis of this East Side sound um, that scholars write about. And uh, you also had a mixture of soul, gospel, Motown, and a little bit of surf music because that's what people were listening to in the surrounding communities. And um, the record labels and the concert promoters who are working uh, together often, you know, somebody who was representing Sam Cooke also worked with Richie Valens, for example, and a lot of the back backing musicians were parts of the same bands for um, these musicians. And um, so you also get um, uh, the venues have been, like I mentioned with La Fonda, are an important part of this history and thinking about space and thinking about place. Um, Natalia Molina is um, a historian at USC now who I really love her work and looking at racial scripts and space and place and community making with restaurants and also looking at um, policies um, trying to keep flip flopping on the ways that um, Latino and, um, and Asian identities are interpreted or policed in, in the United States. So uh, I highly recommend her work too. And um, a lot of the venues that were important for the scene for the East Side Sound um, have been in San Fernando, um, Pomona and San Bernardino and Long Beach. And I'm skipping parts of Los Angeles because um, youth gatherings, interracial gatherings and certain laws about um, performances made it prohibitive. So people had to go out to the outskirts of the region um, to enjoy this music and be a part of and create these music scenes. So these interracial gatherings um, were uh, a way for people to um, overcome how, uh, you know, the neighborhoods were targeted. So thinking of like Boyle Heights, for example, um, you know, and policing was tar targeting certain areas. So people were able to go out and um, make make spaces in places like Almonte and Pomona. So those are the 
two main places that I was reading about for this, but they're not the only two. The Long Beach uh, Civic Center is one uh, important place and there are many others, but these are the two I was interested in for this project. And so live music spaces, especially when we're thinking about what's, what will it be like to be a musician or to be in the arts after COVID. Um, live music spaces are really important. And you know, these places are places where we can challenge and resist or recreate or um, create a new um, uh, societal norms, right? And so uh, these were really important spaces for people in the mid 20th century to explore and, and push against, um, especially uh, taboos against uh, interracial dating. And um, so the Rainbow Gardens uh, used to be in Pomona, California. There's rumors that uh, somebody who is disgruntled, I, I don't know if it's the 70s, um, because they kept getting denied access, they burned it down. But if you've ever been in downtown Pomona, um, there's the YMCA, the big brick building, it was um, within the same block of there. And then you have the El Monte American Legion Stadium, um, which is now a post office in, in El Monte. And I'm hoping to work in these locations with the music video we're planning with my students. Um, and uh, so anyways, these were two of the big spaces where um, concert promoters like um, Candelario Mendoza, who was also a teacher and activist in Pomona, and um, Art LeBeau, who still has a radio program in, in Los Angeles, they hosted concerts here. And um, a lot of the performers' music that we're covering um, was performed in these halls. And uh, Rainbow Gardens actually um, used to be a big band hall, and it was a... Um, uh, it was exclusive, it mostly like Latinos, Mexicans were not allowed. And um, later once Candelario Mendoza started booking like Wednesday night performances um, with Latino or mixed race uh, bands, they, they had such attention that um, that changed over time. And I just want to put in a plug, um, not because anybody asked me to, but because I saw this, I said, oh, this is perfect. Um, I'm pretty sure I have Cinco de Mayo Mother's Day gigs that time. So I hope somebody goes to see this event. Um, it's hosted by one of the centers, um, the Ethics and Policy Center. Um, that's um, Alex Madva, who's a Cal Poly Pomona faculty member, um, is part of. And they're going to be talking about redlining and infrastructure. And so this will completely be a tangent, but so directly related to thinking about space and place and where people were allowed to live and who, who were neighbors and all of that. So um, I highly recommend it and I will try and log in um, if I can. Okay, so I finally made it to the arrangement. We can listen to some music and I just want to preface it with the fact that um, this is a very rough sketch. Uh, recording something with all of the transitions we had was really difficult um, for me to teach it to the students and for me to make sure everybody recorded remotely or at different times and it worked okay. And, um, and then sadly, my microphone had some issues where it was giving distortion. So please bear with us. This is like a first run through, let's say. And so we'll be finishing up this recording uh, soon and then we'll make a video and I'll post it on our Instagram account. And, um, but basically the music goes through um, on, our, on our left hand corner, there's the um, Lalo Guerrero who we've played some of his mariachi ranchera style songs like Cancion Mexicana. And he also was part of the Zoot Suit uh, movement and um, you know, Pachuco culture. And so this is one of his like Cuban influenced and Caribbean influenced jazzy type of uh, Pachuco swing, it's called. Um, then we have, um, I think next is Cannibal and the Headhunters who covered um, a New Orleans gospel song that um, they made their own by adding a different introduction than na 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 na. Um, so I chose their version because um, they, they were just such a uh, monumental group tied to so many Chicano soul and um, African-American ensembles that in the area that I wanted to cover theirs. And this was a really popular song. Um, then we have Ronnie and the Pomona Casuals, which also um, Ronnie and is it Chester? Oh, I'm blanking. You read it last night. Um, 
uh, no, Charlie Lett is the, the lead singer. Um, and so they, they have like Chicano soul, but also some gospel influence that you'll hear in the way uh, that the music's set up and some uh, Motown influence. And that goes into uh, Rosie from Rosie and the Originals um, song, uh, not Angel Baby. It's one of her other songs um, that is, I found a dream. And um, she's just, Angel Baby is still one of the most popular songs from this era. She was one of the only women to really like hit this level of fame in a time that was, it was very difficult for women to be in the scene. Um, she got taken advantage of with her contracts and things like that. Um, but uh, so she's, you have to include her. And then it goes into a quote of a song about El Monte um, by uh, the Penguins, which was actually written by Frank Zappa, um, who lived in Claremont and was very involved in a lot of um, the behind the scenes songwriting for acts, um, uh, Latino and black acts in um, soul music in the time. And then uh, we have Sam Cooke who performed uh, at places like West Covina High School and El Monte Legion uh, with Richie Valens. And, uh, and then Richie Valens, one of his last performances ever was at um, the Rainbow Gardens, West Covina High School and Long Beach uh, Civic Auditorium um, at January 16th and January 17th um, of 1959, I think. And um, so we have his, his original song, Come On, Let's Go, that works with the theme of um, going out to dance and belonging and um, at these musical events. And then I have the end quoting the Los Lobos reinterpretation. Um, they're a band from the 70s, still active and very important part of the East Side Sound. So here we go. It's about seven minutes. So I'll still have time for questions, but um, I hope you enjoy it. And please let me know if there's any issues, I'll monitor the chat to Mary. So.
not uh, letting me exit and show sure. okay um, i'll stop sharing um so yeah i know it's really close to when people have to um, leave and um but i can stay on for extra questions um and i saw some in the chat i think paola you were telling me uh ricky ricardo's cuban i know but nobody else was on tv that spoke spanish so um i felt like watching that i just it made me think of my grandparents like, because my grandfather um, would always speak, you know, with a heavy accent, you know, whether it was in English or in Spanish, his, his family in Mexico, um, our family teased him for having a, uh, an Americanized accent, but it just, it was the closest thing I had in terms of representation. So, um, and I, I'm not sure if there's any other like pressing questions that I missed. Um, but yeah. Dr. Vallejo, I mean, it's, it's an incredible, awesome presentation, you know, highlighting the history, debunking the various stereotypes and myths about Cinco de Mayo, but also like really ending this awesome presentation with some of the folks messaged me privately saying that they're dancing in their chairs, they're bobbing to the music, and I think really appreciating um, the American music that, you know, Latino communities have uh, created. And I, I love the story that you shared about you know, um, taking back the music and the artistry by not working for tips and, and you know, creating this stage, because that's so important. And I love that, um, that this is American fabric. This is part of the music exicon of America. So um, it's, it's awesome. Um, yeah, if we would love to, if you want to hear, if you want to speak out and unmute yourself and ask Dr. Vallejo a question, or if you want to just say comments, but I mean, I think so far, as you can see in the comments, people are just really appreciative and, and showing gratitude for this presentation that you shared along with the link to 
the other, you know, event that you share. I think um, Iris Levine, our Dean Levine has also shared the event, right? So thank you so much, Iris, for yeah. that. Um, yeah, um, any questions or comments that you would like to um, ask or share? Um, so please, see Fatima's please. Hand okay, okay, yeah, Fatima. Hi, um, I just wanted to say, I think that was a great presentation and I love the music and all. Um, but my question is is just a personal question towards you, um, Jesse. So I also played the violin as well when I was younger. And I was just curious, how long have you been playing like instruments and what really got you into um, playing? Um, you know, I started playing violin. I was public school, like didn't have private lessons in the beginning. You know, I, I had to throw a temper tantrum to convince my parents for to pay the rental fee. We were really low income. So um, the extra money for violin in general was almost prohibitively expensive. Um, so I just played a lot um, when I didn't have lessons. I would pick out recordings, uh, rock recordings like that dog and Weezer recordings. And I would practice at home in the summertime. Um, so I've been playing for, I guess, 25 years, but um, I haven't really been focusing on performance in terms of like practicing and working on my technique in the last like 10 years. But um, I do get to play mariachi a lot. Um, so that at least gives me a moment to stay with my instrument, even though um, I wish I had more time to practice. Uh, but I just wanted to play. I just, every time I had friends who had instruments, I'd be like, okay, great, I'll play your piano. It's like, we'll hang out later. <laughs> um so or they would just play with me a lot of my friends were through music too so yeah thank you I, I think uh your presentation also resonated with folks we have someone from Dublin here I just got a mm -hmm. message from someone from New York who's here as well I'm really appreciative what and some people are asking for a part two Jesse um <laughs> Dr. Vejo I think you know I, I agree with Dr. Badua that you definitely are a rock star, but some folks are asking, will there be a part two? And perhaps we can do a face-to-face -face part two when things are safer. That would be awesome with some of your students, you know, sure. if, 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 time commit, if time permits for them. Um, yeah, and I'm just trying to get through a lot of the, the commentary. Please, um, just as a reminder, Daniela, our awesome Wegland intern posted a link for the um, survey that we're asking everyone to fill out after attending this event. So if you would be so kind to just do kind of a, an exit survey of you know what you thought about this event that would be very helpful for us. Um, folks are saying they're happy to reclaim Cinco de Mayo, so those are some of the comments yeah. that we're hearing. Also, just the um, the framing of space and place, especially in in relation to where we are. There's just a lot of synergetic information that you shared about coalition building, but also how it how racism and institutional barriers infiltrated the music industry as well. So I think for a lot of folks, that was a quite an eye opener. For many people so those are some of the comments i'm trying to uh, summarize very quickly for some of the comments that i see so uh, i can say for the recording i'm not going to share it publicly yet just because um it's a work in progress but it's on facebook live so do you want me to take oh, it off that's okay no, no, no that's okay. <laughs> okay um but at least it's in the context of this pre presentation but um we'll be re-recording some parts um and a couple people might contribute additional vocals and things I have to give a major shout out to Alex Mascoro, who's our alumnus, who's stitching all this together and all the technical issues between all the different recording sessions um, is just been so much work. Um, and then hopefully we'll have the, the music uh, tweaked. Uh, so it's like rip polished and then um, we'll have a music video and I'm gonna even incorporate some of the bus stuff like the class pass that's coming up and my love for public transportation um and murals at one of the bus stations in Almani and things like that so um keep an eye out on our Instagram page and I'll make sure I post uh everything there and I'm I'm also some, one of the um attendees are letting me know that there was a glitch with Eventbrite where they didn't get the zoom link so mm -hmm. this will also be up on the um on the YouTube page as well as on the Wegland Facebook I also uh, shared it with uh, Dr. Veo's Facebook page as well so apologies if there was a glitch and folks weren't able to get on smoothly, but we do have people from Colorado all over the place, yeah. all across the nation. Um, so that's really cool. And then I think, you know, there's some folks who are, um, um, Samba was mentioning that they're the only ones from few West Siders around and mm -hmm. a bunch of East Siders in this chat and the event um, feel more accepted and um, more accepted than ever. So thank you for your comments on that. 
Mm -hmm. And um, folks are asking to follow you on Instagram, which is great. And um, yeah, awesome. I really Any appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Oh, Portland is in the house as well. So in Seattle via Chicago. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so we have folks all over. So I see Carly's asking about um, Natalia Molina. She's, she's the one, um, I have one of her books here. Uh, she just got a MacArthur or a Genius Grant. So, but this is the book I have with her. And I got to present with her in Cuba one time and she's just such a wonderful person. Um, and we've had a lot of good discussions about music and history and venues. Um, but I do think what I'll do is I'll uh, compile my reading list that goes with the presentation and I can make a link to it on our link tree on Instagram so that you can um, log in later. I'll have a link to this lecture and a link to the, the notes. Um, of suggested readings because I, I'm just skimming the surface of what so many scholars have done um, to teach myself and help me teach my students more. So that's awesome. And then once we get that, we'll also share it on the Weglin website as well of um, you know suggested recommended readings from some of our uh, experts in the field. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for spending your um, afternoon with me. And remember, it's not Cinco de Drinco. Um, let's go ahead and inform folks and educate people about the music, uh, musical exicon of Latino communities and the impact that they've had in the American music industry. And thank you so much, Dr. Vallejo, for this awesome presentation and sending us off in a very dancing and you know fun move despite this you know weird environment that we're in. I hope that everyone is staying safe. And if you're fortunate, like I, I'm a double vaxxer now, so very excited about that. And um, please stay safe. We hope to see you all in person very soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. <laughs> Thank you.